screen like 30 seconds of pause. We are live. Welcome to Champions Park Lake Studio for our new edition, Homeschooling. Uh, since all the college or all the kids are out of school and doing homeschooling, what better way to do? Let's do some boat racing homeschooling. I'm your host or I, I guess uh, proctor or whatever you want to call it. Uh, my name is Dana Potts. I'm the promoter of Champions Park Lake in Springfield, Ohio, home of the APBA Stock, Board, Stock Outboard Nationals, July 12th through the 18th, also home of Wake the Lake, August 7th through the 9th, which hosts the NGK F1 Series, and also we've moved uh, our other event, the Inboard Hydro Driving Experience, to Labor Day weekend, so we're excited to ha continue to have that event. So um, we started an, a new series. We kind of introduced it last week with uh, Chris Fairchild. I've always had this conversation with folks. We need to educate our fans, but also let's have a conversation while we're all at home uh, working on our boats and everything. Let's let's talk race boats. So um, again, don't forget, I got Hydro Shot to drink all night and to let my folks out on the West Coast know, I got two of them tonight to drink all night because we're going to talk we're going to talk tunnel boats tonight. So as a reminder, feel free to chime in, ask a question, make a comment, tell us where you're from. We'll try to get them answered. Uh, Rick Hoffman is our guest tonight, our, our professor of tunnel boats tonight. You're going to answer questions, talk about tunnel boat racing. Welcome, Rick Hoffman. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. Glad to have you back on the show. I'm just, I'm pulling up to make sure we're live because I don't want to go too long with you know without getting into things so um let me make sure i do believe we're live hopefully we'll uh, have some questions chime up here um uh, so let's uh, rick let's talk some basics of tunnel boat racing uh tunnel boat racing's been around for a long time and you know when people come out and watch it my fans come out and they say man that's a that's an airplane on the water um are there a lot of, explain some of the characteristics and is it like an airplane? Yeah, it really is. You know, down the straightaways, that's what you're trying to do is fly the boat. You're trying to get as much of that boat out of the water as you can. Hopefully we'll uh, have some questions. So uh, the only time it's really a true boat is in the turns and it's all boat. But as soon as, as soon as you get through the turns, you want to get that thing up out of the water as soon as possible, as much of it out of the water so that you can build two next turn you know so yeah you have to learn how to fly the boat down the straightaway and, uh, so you've driven them you, you've you driven them and built them so there is a there there's a tunnel and the reason it's called a tunnel is there's a yeah. tunnel of air that goes down the middle so the leading edge of that tunnel is that like an airplane wing yes does it act like an airplane wing yeah there's a center section over the between the tunnel and the decks that is, you know, an airfoil section that can be changed and move the lift around on the boat. And so it does the same thing as a wing on, on an airplane. You know. And the faster you go, the more effect that has. So it all depends on horsepower and how fast the top speed of the boat is and, you know, how you design the decks and how much influence you want that lift to have. So um, we have the, the tunnel, then you have the sponsons, which is like a pontoon boat. You've got a tunnel of air, yep. and you have the sponsons. The sponsons are used to really dig into the water, correct? Yeah, that's their, you know, they're most important in the turns. They're what really lets tunnel boats turn the way they turn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at videos from the early days of tunnel boats back in the 60s compared to now, you know, they didn't turn anything like we do now. In fact, if you tried to turn one of those like that, you either rolled the boat or spun out or wrecked. You know, they just mm -hmm. weren't capable. So they've developed to what they are now uh, over those period of years. So it just keeps getting more refined, you know. And uh, they just get better and better and, and turn harder and harder. And the drivers get better and the boats are safer. And it just all builds to more performance. What would you say, um, <clears throat> as the racers these days, what's the biggest key in handling that airplane on the water is it as much boat out as the water turn speed what what's the biggest key uh, you 
know, you got to have, as a driver, you got to have timing and feel, and you got to be able to feel the balance of the boat, and you got to be able to adjust that balance. You know, you don't want to run around the straightaway with the nose stuck up in the air because now you're just pushing a bunch of air. Mm-hmm. You know, that takes horsepower and speed. So, you know, you want to be able to run that boat as flat and loose as you can. That's the whole key to it, you know. And, and some guys like them real loose in the back end, and some don't. And, uh, mm-hmm. You know, that's the whole key to tunnel boat racing is balance and, and getting that boat to run loose. Not out of control loose, but pretty much right there, you know. You know, it, I, and I have a lot of uh, friends in car racing, from IndyCar to, to, you know, NASCAR. We know guys, Steve D'Souza and stuff, um, karting, various things. You know, one of the things I talk to a lot of these guys, and they are somewhat jealous of our sport, is that you can still go build it and bring something new out. For instance, in drag racing, stock car, or indie car, it's a spec. You got to fit it in this box. You can't really do that much to it because it's all the spec racing. What's great about boat racing is I can go build a new boat. I can try something different on the bottom. I can do a lot of different things. Now, obviously, there are some parameters. So tell me some of the parameters that you have to stick to within uh, NGK F1 boat. Say, for instance, length, weight, things of that nature. <clears throat> well, there's the weight limit. So, you know, we do have a weight limit you have to stay within, uh, a minimum weight. You can't mm-hmm. be under that weight uh, with driver coming out of the race. You have to meet a, a given weight limit. Um, as far as specs go, there's a minimum length on it, and um, that's pretty much it. You know, uh, then there's engine requirements. But as far as the boat goes, there's a length. And then a weight. Uh, and, and there's a safety safety capsule. Yeah, there's correct? safety capsule. Yeah, you have you have that aspect. Sorry about that. Yeah, you have you have to have safety cells, and you got to be registered and uh, approved, and and all that. You got to go through that whole process. You can't just go build something and show up with it. You know, it has to be tested and pass the testing. And so it's a it's a relatively easy test to pass uh, if you're familiar with composites, but you know, if you're not, you might struggle a little bit. Mm-hmm. What do you What do you tell someone getting into this sport that is thinking about, like, saying, I want to go out and buy a 45, or I want to go out and I want to get involved in the sport? Where should they start? What kind of boat should they look at? You know, say I'm say use me as an example. I'm five seven, let's say 160 pounds. <laughs> Well, maybe a couple years ago, but where do I start? You know, where, for you, what would for you, you recommend? Your, your size would be 45. That would mm-hmm. be an obvious choice. Um, 45 is the best place to start people that have no experience in tunnel boats because you're not mm-hmm. going that fast and they're very affordable and there's lots of racing to do. The downside to that is they can't handle anybody much over, you know, 175 pounds and be competitive. And mm-hmm. even 175, I think you're pushing it. You know, you need to be 160. My race weight when I was doing those was 155, and I had no problem. So if if someone's going to get in there, and they're a larger person, then they're probably going to have to start in, you know, something that's a, a little bigger. You know, you could probably do SSD 60, or or maybe even go into a 120 would be a good mm-hmm. would be able to do just because of their body size. Yeah. Do, so. It, you know, as that person, they should get to the race. They should, probably should ask around, talk to people like yourself. Um, you know, a lot of these guys are on budgets too, so maybe find a comparable, um, a good boat that's a comparable size driver. Because you said balance is a big key on this, uh, because the way the way you build the the front edges and things of that nature. Um, once you advance into the sport. What, what are a lot of the things that you can play with? Because you see the aerodynamics of the boat, of the top half, and everybody's like, oh, that looks like a fighter jet. That's really cool. But really, the biggest key is the bottom of that boat. Everything on the bottom is the magic, to my understanding. Um, what can you play with there? What can you do? What's kind of maybe been the evolution of things underneath that boat? Uh, you can do whatever you want. There's really no rules to do or not do anything. 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, and as far as we're talking about ghosts, I mean, it's, you know, there's, everything's based on horsepower and speed, so, and speed's based on how much horsepower it has, and, and that dictates boat design. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's just a big circle of performance, I call it a big pie, you know, and you can slice that pie up however you want, but when you, you're going to take something from here and you're going to give it up over there. You know, so you just mm. move the performance around, and that's kind of what really goes on over the years. You know, the boats are pretty much, the bottoms are pretty much dialed in, you know. The, really, the only thing that changes is the horsepower of the classes, you know, whether we're running injected motors or carb motors or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. That dictates the bottom of the boat. So, Got it. You know, it just kind of goes around in circles, and, you know, it's like fashion and clothes. What's fashionable in the 70s is starting to come back in some times here lately. And same thing hmm. in the boats, you know, we want a little performance. We don't want so much acceleration as we want turning ability. So we give up a little of this to get a little of that. Well, once everybody accomplishes that, then nobody's got an advantage. So now we start looking for other advantages. And so we end up going back to some old, old ways, old things that used to work before. And so, you know, it just goes around and around, you know, there's, there's nothing revolutionary going to come out on the bottom of the boats, right? They're, they're pretty much what they are and dialed in. The big, yeah. The big changes are going to come in engines, you know, and are coming in engines. That's where the big developments going to come, and then that will dictate hull design. That will di- dictate changes in hull design and everything. Now, I, I would assume, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, the style of water that you race on consistently dictates the size of the boat and and the underside of the boat. Yeah. So. You know what? What are your standard links that you see in the NGK series? Because NGK runs a pretty diver, diverse series. I mean, because they did run in Gulfport. Um, you're up in Bay City, which is rough. You come down the Champions Park Lake, which is smooth, but you have a right hander. Um, what are you typically seeing in the links? Well, that's where you know that is probably the one big variable that does change uh, is the water conditions, and and generally what changes that is just whether it's rough water, smooth water, or, you know, big, long straightaways or what have you. But, um, you know, rougher water, you want a little bit more boat, so you're going to want a longer boat. You know, something mm-hmm. that's smoother, got shorter straightaways, you know, like, like Springfield with, you know, uh, more turns in it, more shoots, mm-hmm. short tubes, then you're going to want a little shorter boat, something that accelerates quicker. But that boat's not going to handle Bay City quite as well as a longer boat and can handle more speed. So... Mm-hmm. You know, it's a big, as the sport gets back to being uh, more progressive and, and more successful, we start getting more boats and more races and there's more money coming back into it and people are spending more money, then guys are going to start having specialty boats. Instead of one boat for every course all year, some guys are going to start saying, you know, I might want to have, have a little longer boat for those Bay City and Florida races and, and, and what have you, you know, because they do work better in the rough mm-hmm. water, but they don't do so much in the, in the smooth as a shorter boat goes. And again, it's now, all horsepower based. So. Yeah, yeah, it's all horsepower based. Um, now, we've seen kind of an ev- – we're starting to see a, uh, in the U.S. an evolution of boats. We're going from – you know, we were pretty wood heavy for a while, and now we're we're catching up and doing a lot of composites. And, and your, your stuff has been kind of at the forefront of the composites. Where do you see um, – where do you see our the the U.S. series going with these composites? Because we we you know we got some guys building a new boat with a a wood bottom. You know what what do you see as the advantages of a composite and different things that you can do with it? Well, you know, uh, it's just unlimited what you can do with composites. I mean, you it's just. Today's composites, and, and you know, composites is a pretty general term because the, within that term, it's there's so many defined and subdivisions and processes that are, are different, and some are better and some are worse. So, you know, it's just endless where it can go. It's just where it needs to go, you know. We just can't build wood boat anymore. And, and you, first off, you can't get the wood. It's, it's getting harder to get those, you know, some of those woods anyway. And, Mm-hmm. You know, the, com- the composite boats, if you've watched anything on overseas and watched them in the H2O crashes, you know, they're just far more durable. So, yes, they are more expensive to buy, but mm-hmm. less expensive to maintain. Because I guarantee you go blow over one of these wood boats like we used to do all the time, and they don't come out very well on a road. 
uh, well, nowadays, you know, they're pretty much indestructible, you know. A, a lot of the stuff they're building in Europe is going right to the limits of strength, you know, because they, they don't want to carry around any extra weight or any extra strength. So it's built just strong enough to withstand crashes. And I'm not saying they're indestructible and they never break, because everything can break, hit the right way or the right you know, position. But, you know, long term, they're just a better investment for your money than a wood boat. Got it. Got it. Um, have you seen, uh, you know, um, have you, s is there any evolution past composites? I know we have carbon fiber. I've actually, you know, I've got friends that work for Porsche racing team and they've seen uh, that they're using hemp, uh, hemp leaves in uh, composites now uh, to have more flex and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I've done a little research on that. The problem with the hemp is it absorbs water. Yeah. So that's a no-go as far as I'm yeah. concerned. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't put any wood organic materials in my boat. So, yeah. You know, there's, you can drill holes in it. You're not going to absorb wood um, or water. I mean, so hemp would be a no-go. You know? <laughs> I'm sure it has its great properties for what it does, but, you know, what we, yeah. do, we need to keep the boat stiff and rigid. To, mm -hmm. to maintain performance and consistency. So mm -hmm. you can't do that when you got something that's flexing. And then there's stuff we need to flex, but not the boat. Do you, when you look at building a boat, um, do you look at a driver's um, style? Do you look at his weight? Do you look, do you position the, the cockpit in different points? Can you do that? I mean, what, what are a lot of the what are the playing points that you see with your boats and in the sport right now that can handle the horsepower that we have? Um, yeah, I can build mine any way I want. Mine are constructed in six pieces now, and so I basically have a modular construction, and, and there's six major pieces to the boat. Within those pieces, there's geez, I lost count of them. I think there's forty something molds to make a boat. And uh, a lot of split molds and multi-piece molds and all that stuff to, to make it right. But I can build one any width I want. I can change the length. And uh, that's on this current generation. And the next generation, I'm going to go even farther with it. So, yeah, I can move the capsules around front to back, you know, and do whatever, any width tunnel, any wedge, any whatever, you know. And uh, setback, all that is adjustable. Got it. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. Back when I started building the composite boats, back in uh, you know, the first ones were back in like oh four or oh two or three somewhere in there, and um, you know, just the technology has come such a long ways. I mean, the composites has gotten so good for the materials themselves that you can. It's just amazing the stuff you can do now that you couldn't do fifteen years ago. So. Uh, people are chiming in. Feel free to ask questions, folks. Ask questions. We got them here. I know you probably don't want to ask all the secret questions because then Rick will uh, give away all his secrets. But uh, feel free to ask questions. Chime in. I'm surprised K Dub hasn't chimed in, but you know, you know, this year we have the stock outboards. Um, you know, and that's a that's a really I kind of call that the go kart class of boat racing which is great. We love him. We love those guys. A lot of participants. What do you tell someone that's thinking about that have done that for a handful of years? And I think we've got a couple guys there. Uh, I think Jesse Swain's moving over from stock outboards to a tunnel boat. What do you tell those guys that been used to doing three laps and on their knees, how they're going to adjust and get into a tunnel boat, say a 45 to a, I don't know what to tell them. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> You know, that's going to be a because they're going to have to do more in the cockpit. They're going to have to yeah. trim trim it out. And I think the biggest adjustment for them will be they're restricted in their movement. You know, they're not going to be able to move around. Yeah. So uh, I remember when capsules first came about, you know, back there, 89, 90, that that was the biggest thing I remember noticing was just your restricted movement. You know, you couldn't move around in the boat anymore as much as you did. But you get over it and it's no big deal then, but. I think that's what he'll have, or they'll have issues with is being strapped in like that. Being strapped in and, and having not able to use their body weight to really move the boat around. They're going to have to feel the boat 
and really control it with their steering wheel uh, and just hope they don't hit the eject button too much. That's right. <laughs> Now, um, we've always talked about this the, on the shows. Props and motors are key. Prop is huge. Uh, and boat racing, prop. if you find a prop that's good, do you, do you interact with a lot of the prop guys and, and discuss your boat design with, with their props and how it can change the performance of your boat? You know, I, I haven't done that, you know, recently since I got back in, you know, so... I know that goes on a lot with some other guys and, uh, you know, I think you can, you got good drivers and you got good prop guys and you got good boats. It's all going to work out and come together and everybody kind of collaborates. And, you know, I've been around this really my whole life. So, you know, you just get to the point where you can watch something on the water and tell what it needs or what it's doing or what it's not doing, you know, mm -hmm. in generalities, not exactly specific, but, and that can point you in the right direction on propellers. So if you don't have a prop guy in your back pocket, it's not the end of the world, you know, just get better at driving and feeling. Yeah. That boat telling you everything it needs. You just got to listen to it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, new guys getting in, what do you see? You know, it's, it's that feel. And I've always told drivers, you got to be able to feel the boat. You got to be able to feel the car so you can give feedback to the engineer. What should a driver be feeling as they're flying it down the middle and they're trimming it back and forth? I mean, well, is, is that is that experience or is that you know? Can you teach that? Can you explain that to them? Is it lap time? Is it you know? What's it take to get to that point? It takes experience, seat time. There's really no solution to it other than that. You know, some guys are just naturally talented at finding that edge. Mm -hmm. And we'll get on to what makes the boat go fast real quick. And, you know, some guys got to work at it a little longer. You know, it just depends on the person, really. You know, you just got, but in any level with them, whether they're good at it naturally or not, you know, you only get better with seat time. So, yeah. You know, drive, 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 drive. You know, drive everything you can get your butt into. When I was driving, I drove everything that somebody offered me. I didn't care what it was, I just got in and drove it. Yeah, because it's valuable. Yeah. It's even it's even if you're driving a even if you're driving a stock outboard, yeah. you know you're still getting feel of props and yeah. water and how it yeah. how it reacts. And that's the biggest thing. You got to be able to feel what that prop's doing, and what the boat's doing in reaction to that. You know, so if you can't feel that, you're just out there running around blind. You know, you. Really have to pay attention to that, and unfortunately, you're going to have to find the edge the hard way sometimes. That's what everybody does. It nobody's excluded from it, unless mm -hmm. you just don't want to go that fast or you're not that competitive, and that's okay. But if you want to be competitive, you're going to find that edge. You know, you're yeah. going to find that limit, and once you find that limit, you should be able to go right back to it right away, without. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, you got to go there, go fast. There's just there's no way around that. Hey, we, we've got people chiming in. They can't hear you. So I don't, uh, Jamie, our producer, um, I don't know if we, you can crank your volume up. Rick, can you crank your volume up? I'm, a, I'm all the way up. Maybe you're going to have to get closer. Okay, maybe. How's that? <laughs> it's not better, better for the pic. See, it's not better for the picture, but it's better for the sound. See if everybody can hear now. <laughs> uh Austin Cheatham chimes in, Cheatham Racing. How many uh, boats have you built over the years, including 45s and F1s? Now, you're old, so I don't know if you can, re you know, remember all that. Yeah, well, I think I've got my, my sheet, my serial number sheet. and uh, Oh, you have a serial number sheet. Yeah. Mm. So, I think the last time I caught it, it was like in a... You know, I really haven't only built four boats since I've been back in. So it took 15 years off. So I quit in 04. I think I was at like 110 or 115, somewhere in there. And I did that in 10 years, you know? Yeah. So. I mean, many times we talk in cars, you, you can never build a chassis the same. 
and because they try to, they put it in a jig, they try to do it. You just can't do it. Drag racing guys try to do it and, and they get a new chassis and they think it's exactly the same. And it's like, Oh, this thing's a turd. Do you run into the same problems building boats? I mean, obviously you, you, you have specs and everything. Every boat comes out as different no matter what. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's the same thing. You know, you, when it's put together by hand and the materials, even though they may be the same, there's still variables in those. And, you know, you can get it really, really close, but we're all, we're always looking for that magic boat or that magic prop and that magic engine, you know? Mm -hmm. So it exists in every facet of the sport. It's, that magic gear case that for some reason just it's faster than everything else you got. And that's the same thing in the boats, you know, you can get them zeroed into where in general they're all fast, but out of that group that you build that there's one that's just special, you know, for for whatever reason, you don't know why it all measures the same, but it's just a little bit faster. Got a better feel. Exactly. K-Dub chimes in for her first question of the night, guys. Drink up Uh out in California. Um, as a boat builder and designer, can you tell what makes can you tell us what makes your design stand out from the others? Besides that it looks gorgeous. I mean, you look at it and it looks like a Ferrari, but I'll let you sell your boat. You know, uh, you know, here's what my thing with with what I do and what I build is, you know, when I got back into this, I decided that I was going to build, you know, when I got back into this with Spencer and I wasn't going to do it unless I could just do it the way I wanted to do it with the newest and the best processes and, and everything, you know, all the best materials, all the best epoxy. So that's what I did. Everything of mine is infused, which means basically in general, it's all one laminate. There's no cold joints. It's all one piece. So, you know, my materials put in the, in the mold dry and then pulled down under a bag and then the resins infused into that dry laminate. So once it goes catalyzed and it's hard, it's one laminate, you know, there's no laying the laminate down and then letting it kick off and then putting the core down and then letting that kick off. And then, so it's not multiple layers in there. It's one laminate. Now you can get that with wet bagging, you know, you can put all your laminate in wet and then bag over the top of that. And you get the same thing. You get a one piece laminate, but the downside to that, and that's the way I built my first, my first composite boats 15 years ago is that you're you're putting that resin in by hand and whatever you put in there there's only so much that's going to come out through the bleeder once the bleeder's full of resin that's Mm -hmm. it everything else stays in there so the way i'm doing it now where it's infused is that that laminate is compressed under vacuum total vacuum so it's as thin as it can get it's as compressed as it can get and then the resin fills that void you see so there's no excess resin i can control my laminate my resin to material ratio is right on the mark every time and the laminates are just super strong Mm -hmm. Um, it's the best way to do it other than going pre-preg and you can't do pre-preg because it really doesn't apply to the materials that we use in boat racing you know they just won't work i'm going to start doing some pre-preg small parts uh you know dashboards and deck plates and covers and buckets and, and all that kind of stuff but uh that's that's the big thing you know i don't put any wood in there i always wanted to build a boat with no wood no balsa core the first mm-hmm. boat i built for spencer we had some balsa core in the bottom but everything after that is all carbon all epoxy all infused you know the, the materials are just so strong right now it's just unbelievable what i'm getting out of them. so so you're saying it's one piece one piece makes it stronger makes it more rigid. Right. So if it were to bump, get into accidents, it's going to hold its structure and everything. How does that compare to, say, the boats over in Europe? Because it, it, many times we look at the boats in Europe, they're a little ahead of us, uh, or they have been in the past. They've been ahead of us. Um, we're catching up. Um, how does that? How does your boat compare to, say, like a DAC or, or a moor over in, in uh, Europe? Well, you know, I... Uh, I can't say exactly because obviously they won't let me over there to see how they're doing stuff, but I've seen pictures and, and what have you. And the best I can gather, and I know it's for a fact, but they're wet layup uh, boats. Um, and so 
they're built modularly so that they can, you know, adjust them just like I'm, I'm going to do and in, in doing. But uh, I think the way my process, the infusion is uh, a step beyond what they're doing. I know mm. what my parts come out, what they weigh and uh, how strong they are. And they're just unbelievable. You know, I've done some tests and made tests on all kinds of the processes, wet layup, bagging, and then, you know, laying it up laminate by laminate. And uh, it's just no comparison on the, on the strength and the weight. Yeah, it's more expensive. But like I was saying earlier, you're going to pay for that. That's, gonna, that's an insurance policy you're paying because when you wreck that boat and you're going to do it eventually, your damage is going to be far less mm-hmm. than it would be if it was a wood boat. I mean, how many times have we seen in the old days guys go buy a brand new boat, brand new wood boat, and they go out and destroy the thing in the first turn? How many times have you seen that, right? I think you've done you've done it, and uh, I remember Mark Trotter doing that to one of your Hoffmans in a right hand turn yeah. <laughs> in yeah. North Carolina. <laughs> and, and so, you know, again, you know, if you're going to repair that wood boat, well, you know, repairs aren't cheap. And, uh, is there is there a difference in feel? Because I, you know, the wood guys have always said, well, I get a better feel of the boat when I turn it, and and I can make adjustments to the bottom of it you know, throughout the years, because I remember working on the wood boats and, and Bill was religious after every, whatever, three races, we're flipping the boat, sanding it, redoing it. Um, do you see a lot of that? I mean, once you have a, a good solid boat, the rigidity is, are, are you going to have to do a lot of that stuff or can you? Well, yeah, you can change the bottoms. You know, you, you can do whatever you want with them after you get them and put them together and we'll run them. You can, you can add and change and, you know, they're actually, you know, it's, for me, it's just as easy. It's not any harder than the old wood boats. It's just a different way of doing it. You know, it's a different, you're working with wood or you're working with composites. You know, it's, it's just not, there's no restrictions. Let me put it that way. I don't find any restrictions. And, and some of it is actually easier. Mm-hmm. So it's just a way of learning. You know, and the old thing, the guys are saying, well, the wood boats just feel better. And, you know, they might've felt better, those guys. That's what they started out doing and, and when composite boats started coming in, yeah, they had a different feel. It's a mm-hmm. different feel. There's no doubt. But you don't hear that anymore because most everybody's, you know, the boats have gotten so much better and the materials have gotten better and the boats are stiffer and they're just repeatable and they don't loosen up over time. And, you know, they just get better. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. It's just a, it's just what, you, what you're used to, I guess, you know. So, Do you feel... I mean, back in the the 80s and 90s, you know, guys were buying boats every year and they were passing them down. Do you feel these the new boats that you're building, are they going to have a longer lifespan in the series to where maybe it was maybe it was a, you know, back in the heyday, it was a year or two years. You're getting a new boat because you need to perform better. You know, will this boat last longer? And, you know, can I keep it for five, ten years? Well, yeah, you can keep it, but, you know, it's racing, so nobody's going to want to do that. <laughs> yeah, true. So, I mean, the front guys, they're going to buy new boats every couple of years no matter what. Yeah. You know, because as a builder, I'm always trying to improve the construction to help the performance. So maybe the outer design doesn't change, but maybe I change the internal and change the weight around in the boat and the balance or change the mm-hmm. deck a little bit or, you know capsule safety stuff gets implemented so there's always going to be forward movement in design you know no matter what so the boats will last i mean there's dacs out there running around that are 20 25 years old and i've got three or four old composite boats that are 15 years old and they're still running around so yeah the newer stuff is going to be around a long long time you know and they don't dry rot (laughs) (laughs) oh so um what typically does your boat weigh when it comes out compared to, say, you know, a wood boat? You know, I, here's the deal with that. So I get asked that a lot. I can make those things as light as I want and be just as strong, you know, or strong enough to do the job. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's no real big – there's an advantage to having them be light, but you don't – there's no reason to go too light, you know? So I like to build them light enough where 
you have some adjustability in the boat, meaning you can move weight around. You know, so mm -hmm. the boat's all done and rigged, you might still have to add 50 pounds to the boat, per mm -hmm. se, as an example. But, well, I can move that 50 pounds around. Yep. And so there's my adjustability. Because, you know, we're not like cars where we can change springs and <clears throat> change mm -hmm. all the suspension geometry. <clears throat> Once we get the bottom dialed in, you're pretty much locked into that. Yeah. So now you got to you got to change your balance, and you know mm -hmm. that that's a fine art in a tunnel boat. Yeah, find that balance and find the right prop to match yep. with your motor, and, and that's pretty much can dial that in and knows what they want. You know, it can convey that information. That's what they need. You know, and yeah. with the guys on the beach that are watching the boat, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Folks, feel free to chime in. Ask some questions for Rick on anything on boat racing, ask him if he, you know, he'll take orders tonight too. If you want to comment, I, you know, I tell you what, we'll do a 50% off tonight, tonight only. They got to comment, put the order in and the Venmo. If you Venmo me the money, I'll make sure it gets to Rick. How's that? Perfect. 50% off tonight only. If you, you know, if you ask a question, <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> yeah, the big thing in Springfield is we have a right-hander. Do you see any challenges with, you know, with building your boats with that right-hander? No. No difference. Yeah. No. yeah. Because you pretty much, we no longer, it's no longer set up to turn left, left, left. You you want a completely balanced boat that where you can maneuver it around the course any which way. Yeah. I mean, you know, and even if it's not, it's, you know, I don't know. I, I just got in and drove stuff, so I have that same mentality. Well, if it's right-hander, it's just what it is. You deal with it. You drive, you drive it. You know, mm -hmm. you, there's no there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. If you don't like them, then you're not going to go fast. You know? Some people love them. You just drive it. And you know, the boats will turn just as hard to the right as they will to the left. Mm -hmm. So it's just people aren't used to turning them to the right. So that's it is an uncomfortable feeling to get used to. But you know, what do you got to do? You got to get used to that. <laughs> you get comfortable yeah. with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we talked earlier off air and we talked about this, this new phenomena of four cycles. And we know, we know Mercury's working on a V8 four cycle. Obviously four cycle we know is going to weigh a little more on the back of a boat. What do you see as the evolution change of the bottom of the boat or the way the boat's going to be built with that heavier motor? I mean, you you can you were around the V eight days with a heavy motor on the back. Um, so, what do you see the difference or the change or the evolution of that of that race boat going to be? You know, it'll just go again. It depends on the motors and the speed, how fast they're going, because that has a lot of influence on it. But in general, you know, the pads are probably going to get a little bit wider, and you know, tunnels are already the tunnels are already wider or as wide on the modern new V6 boats as the V8s were back 25 years ago. So, and, 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 and I'll stop you right there. Why are they wider now? Carry the weight. You know, the why the wider? Because they got to be, uh, the European boats especially, you know, have the crash boxes up there, you know, and those crash boxes carry, they're, they weigh. They, they have some weight. There's like, you know, let's add another... 40, 50 pounds up there, maybe mm. 30, but whatever, but it's an extra 30 pounds, let's just say for numbers, sitting up there at the front of the boat with the worst place that you put it. So you have to have some way to carry that weight and not mm. the boat. So, you know, you need to. So, so by doing a wider, a wider tunnel, you'll be able to get it off the water quicker Yep, is what you're saying. And you got to get that weight off of the front. Yeah. It's just a wing loading, like an airplane, you know, got it. that's how they measure wing loading, square footage of the wing. How much does the plane weigh? That gives you your wing loading. Well, it's the same thing on a tunnel boat. It's no different. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to add a bunch of weight up there, well, and you want to you want to keep that wing loading like it was, then you need to make some adjustments in there. You need to carry some more surface area to bring that loading to where it needs to be. Got it. K-Dub chimes in. Drink up, boys. On average, how long does it take to design and build a boat? And how much input does each driver have on the design? Um, well, design from scratch or design from just start to build one, you know? It took, um, 
Well, use Dylan Anderson. That's your most yeah. recent boat. And well, that's, uh, I'll answer you probably. Both ends of that. Both yeah. So to start from scratch, like on this, this new version, uh, I think it was 18 months um, from the time we decided to do it to the time the first boat got in the water. <clears throat> so uh, that was from nothing to the first boat in the water, molds and first boat. Now, just to build uh, a standard production boat, or what I would call a production boat, it's about three months. Now, all the tooling's done, it's about mm -hmm. three months. But, you know, in that, I'm always making changes to each boat because you're always trying to move forward. You know, you build one, you see how it goes, and, and you make changes. So every one takes a, a little bit longer, a little less, because we're always modifying things as we go. So even though it's composite and I got molds, I can still chop things up and, you know, modify them and move things around. So uh, just to address that modifying, so for instance, you build a boat for Spencer, you build a boat for, for Foster, and they've been out on the water. What are you looking at and what are you asking them what I need to change in the boat. You, what are you looking at on the performance of the boat and materials and anything? What I mean, are you collecting data? Are you just getting feedback? Are you watching? To, you know, what is that process in your mind to, to, to evolve that boat? Feedback and, you know, I watch the boat a lot. I mean, my eye, but, you know, I'm looking for balance. You know, I want... I want that t tail to pop. I don't want that thing riding around dragging its ass everywhere. So mm -hmm. I'm always making observations on that and get that boat to run flat. You know, that boat needs to come down into the turn flat and it needs to come out of the turn flat. Not like this and not like that into the turn. You're just mm -hmm. rubbing speed, you know. The, the heavier you bury it into the turn, the longer it's going to take you to get out. So I look for a boat in a you know, I look at a lot of boats. I watch everybody run. And, you know, the boats that don't trim a lot are usually the guys going the fastest, mm -hmm. if you watch. And the guys that are standing up all over the place, you know, and burying the boat in turn, they're just scrubbing speed, you know. They're just losing time. They might be a faster boat, but you can't drive a boat around the course like that and be fast. Mm -hmm. So that's what uh, I look at. I look for balance and, and speed, and then I make my changes in what I see immediately on the next boat have you ever do you do you calculate data do you gather data i mean you've been around a long time so you have an eye for it but um and we talked about this off air is like you know we're all getting older yep. we need to get younger people involved in this sport so how do i get you know i've got young people that are maybe tuning in and you know i've got kids that that get excited at this racing in Springfield and they're like, how do I get involved? I want to do this stuff. So I guess the question to you is, is there, you know, is a apprentice program? Is it, you know, how do we get younger people involved to get that knowledge that you have from all the racing you've done? That's a good question. You know, that's a real or do I even want all that, that knowledge from what's up in that brain of yours? <laughs> I was lucky because I grew up doing this. I mean, I literally have been doing this my whole life. You know, as far yeah. back as I remember, you know, five years old, I can remember being at a race. So, you know, that just comes naturally to me. So I have that passion because that's all I've ever really done. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you get people in nowadays because they got so many other distractions and kids. I mean, I guess you got to get them to a race and I guess you got to get them into a stock outboard as a kid, you know, yeah. you know what they're doing. That's mm -hmm. where they're going to get hooked or they're not, you know, but I, I always use Mr. Rogers. Uh, passion is caught, not taught. That's right. And you know, we, we Rogers, do a college, we do a college, we do a college boat race in Springfield, Ohio, and we got some really smart kids that come out and granted everybody laughs at it. They're only doing 30 miles an hour, but those kids are excited about making a boat run. Right. And the, what's even better. And I throw this data thing out is they think past that and they take technology that now we have and they're putting data points and robots in these boats and they're gathering that data, which I think you're used to the old style. We got to bring that new style in of that kid that he can sit there and he can, he can back up what you're telling him with data. Yep. Say, well, you know, you know, 
the boat's flying this at an angle. If we were, you know, a half degree this way, we would pick up this much speed or whatever, you know, whatever that might be. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's, you know, back in the late 90s, I started working with a company called Pi Research. Mm -hmm. And they were the AIM system back then. They were all the data systems, all the IndyCar guys had it. It was the big, the big company and they're still around doing it. Mm -hmm. But I started doing that back then. And it was uh, me and Foster had a boat that we ran and we got some great results out of that data back then. And it's just, you know, it was hard back then because nobody was really, you know, computer guys. So we were all kind of learning our way through it, but mm -hmm. now it's computers are so normal and there's so many more kids that are, grow up doing it it's just again it's second nature to them so i love it i mean if i get anybody to go test with that wants to go do some data stuff i love it i would love to do that stuff but you know just uh, it takes time to get our sport back up our sport on this side of the ocean is so far behind that way i mean people are using them and they're getting there but you know there's some really good guys that can read data that you can there's a lot to learn off the of data yeah, no, and, and, and we talked with other guys, they look at data, and a lot of times they look at data to confirm their feel uh, in the boat and things of that nature. But I, you know, I've always thought we're, we're still far behind compared to an IndyCar team, compared to a stock car team. I mean, you, you go to Steve D'Souza's pit and you see tons of people analyzing data beyond belief. Um, but, you know, their sport is at a higher level. There's bigger budgets. There's more people playing in the sport. So we're getting there. Hopefully one day we'll, we'll, we'll get there and, you know, the Indy 500 of boat racing will be happening in Champions Park Lake with, you know, 50,000 people in a grandstands. And we're going to be doing pit stops and, you know, they're going to be measuring the density of the water before we put a boat out on there. You know, so. and that's what it takes is it takes really to, to be – effective with your data system you need somebody that's all they do mm -hmm. they come in they get the data off the boat and it goes from there you know they they look at it and talk to everybody who sees what they want to see and get what they want to get and what's going and review it and, but you know it's a it's a science and mm -hmm. you need to know how to you need to know the science you know because there's a lot of stuff that goes on i even that bit i did 20 years ago with them you know, we found out, well, Greg said he liked this belt good. And, and it was, it was fast and it looked good. But the data said the other prop that didn't like, that didn't feel as good or didn't feel as fun was faster. Mm -hmm. hmm. And so, you know, we changed things around based on that. And, you know, we did really well with that at that race. So data is just invaluable. I mean, it's, it's like four strokes. It's just where you have to go. It's going there. You know, it's already there. And if you're not going to get caught up with it and you're not going to go along with it you're going to get behind mm -hmm. absolutely well hopefully we'll get some young kids involved and and i even challenge the boat racers i mean we had 16 college teams at our event and they're jones and they'll they'll come out and help for free um they're jones and to get get more involved and we need that we need those guys because i, I joke with chris i was like these these kids are engineers they're the they're some of the smartest engineers in, in our country. They're going to run companies in 20 years. They're that smart. Uh, and you got them running a, a 30 mile an hour boat, which, you know, we laugh at, but they're learning and they're, they're sponging it up and they're, they're getting that passion. So well, we need to get them into 45s. You know, that's just a great starter class for kids. It's just, or not even, and, and not even driving. We yeah. need to get them working on a boat, you know, right. Get them working on a motor. Because, you know, we all talk about we have to have younger drivers involved. And I said, we need more James Chambers. We need, um, you know, we need more Brandon Powers. We need more um, Fairchilds that are working on boats. We need more Hoffmans. We need, we need that next generation because it, it just, you know, unfortunately, we're all getting old. And, uh, and I, I even joke about it, even in drag racing, when you looked at drag racing, the crew chiefs were old. Uh, but they had knowledge. And the, how do you develop that knowledge? How do you bring those younger people in and, and get right. them to get up to speed? Because it is kind of a bougie woogie science. Let's be honest, you know, uh, because we've, you know, we've sent the boat over to universities 
And I remember Chris Fairchild went to Ohio State University, sat down with their professors and everything, had all these aerodynamic uh, professors there, and they were wanting to make all these drastic changes to the boats. And Chris was like, we did that, did that, slowed it up, slowed it up, slowed it up. And they were like, no, 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 it, that's, that should make it faster. And he's like, we tried it. It doesn't work. Um, right. But you need that. You need that, that curiosity for people to – and that's what I love. And, and some of the, my car racing guys are jealous. You can do that in our sport. You're not constricted. That's what I love about it. I love I love building the composite stuff. I love building the boats. You know, it's it's just the it's really gratifying to build these things and then watch them go out and do what they do. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, change the bottoms and change the construction and you know work on on whatever needs to be worked on. You know, and just making them better. So if so, how did you started in wood boats? How did you? How did you learn to go to composites? Um, well, that's a good question. <laughs> I, did you, know, you, I mean, was it self-taught? Did you just talk to people? Much. You know, what, what, well, what I, was it? When I, you know, I was driving since I was able to drive. So 16, 15, I started actually driving a ton of boats. And then I went to work for Bruce Borkwin, um, back in 85, I think it was. And I worked for Bruce for a while and learned how to build the fiberglass boats, uh, you know, little sports sea boats that he started building. And then we built a couple wood tunnel boats. Uh, I think we built an SST 60, a 120, and a Mod U, and a Champ. And once I learned how to do that, once I learned how to build the wood stuff, I'd already known, because he'd showed how, you know, I've been working doing glass stuff. Then I kind of came back from the V8 stuff and broke out and just started building my own stuff. Now, so how did I get into the composite stuff? I just was always fascinated with composites. Mm-hmm. You know, not fiberglass work per se, but composites, real composites. They just always fascinated me. So I just, you know, started doing it. You know, learned. St- it really started with capsules, I guess. That's where you got to back up and start on it. So that yeah. started from the beginning because I only built boats for one year without, I built one boat that was uncapsulated before they mandated capsules in 45s. And then, Everything after that had to have cells. So that's probably where it really, really started was right from the beginning, you know, was capsules and then evolving those over the years. And then finally got to the point there around 2000, I just decided, you know, this wood boat stuff is kind of, I can kind of see the handwriting on the wall. I felt like, you know, eventually this is going to go away. You just can't keep building wood boats. Mm-hmm. Be a Formula One, you know. So that just spurred me to build composite stuff and really just started there, you know, took my capsule stuff that I was building and just expanded it to build a whole boat. Mm-hmm. Got it. As in a capsule, you know, we've got the crash boxes and everything, and you currently don't have crash boxes on your, your boats. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on the safety of capsules? Where do, is there any thoughts of evolving that and making it better? Well, you know, there's a, that's a, there's a lot to that. You, I mean, this crash boxes do their job. There's, you know, instances where they, they work and they do their job. They cost money, you know, mm-hmm. they add a substantial cost to the boat. There's no way around that. You, they're, they're very technical to build and, and done rightly. They're expensive. You can still build cells nowadays, you know, a 3,000, 4,000 Newton cell. You can, you can build a 5,000 Newton cell if you want. There's no restriction on how high you can go, at least here in the States. So, um, I don't know. Cells, the cells nowadays are so much stronger than they ever were 15 years, 10 years, 15 years ago. I mean, 15 years ago. Uh, and all I can do is compare what I was building 15 years ago to what I'm building now. It's, they're mm-hmm. not even this can't even classify them in the same class they're so far advanced so yeah there's a lot to do i think you know having uh enclosed cockpits is a big deal you know i decided to build mine with a top hatch hatch entry mm-hmm. for a couple reasons because um you know it's very much like indycar and f1 has done they've got the halos well we've got two halos we've got the halo that runs around this way and then you've got the front halo over the front 
those mm. are built-in parts of the cell. They're not they're not added on. It's not a shell. It's a part of the cell. And then when you put that heavy three eighth laminate uh, windshields on there, you know that mm -hmm. also adds to the structure. But you know, I, there's there's a lot to do and a lot a lot of safety stuff that can always be because it's always evolving. You know, it's just mm -hmm. always evolving. Like with Hans devices, well that that complicates the whole exiting the cockpit thing, you know, with how that cell is, is designed. You know, the top of the cell has been designed a long time ago before Hans devices were around. Well, now mm -hmm. they got the Hans devices everybody's wearing, and, and some guys are getting caught on the top of the cell with their Hans device. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that has not been addressed. I've, I've addressed it on mine. It wouldn't be legal in Europe, but it's legal here, you know. So there's a lot to it. You know, there's no mm -hmm. one way to do it. There's all kinds of ways to do it, but that's how I do it. Got it. Got it. Well, we're wrapping up, folks. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. We're going on an hour. So um, we're going to continue this series of education, homeschooling for boat racing. Uh, next week, we've got Bill Gore on our show. We're going to talk motors, horsepower, which uh, relates to the boat. So... Uh, Feel free to chime in next week. Uh, we're going to do this on a regular basis. Uh, I'm not doing a show every night just to let everybody know because I'm actually getting ready for a race because we're going to be racing August 5th through the 7th or August 7th through the 9th. I almost got, I, I got so anxious. I wanted to do it on the 5th, uh, which we might do it all week if, if that, if that's, you know, I think everybody's jonesing to get on the water. So, yeah. um, thanks everybody for joining uh thank you rick for coming back on we know you moved out to colorado i'm so glad you got one picture up and it was at least a boat so and it was a boat that i saw you race in not yeah. not that old stuff that i didn't get to see you race in so but thanks again for coming on uh if anybody's interested feel free to uh, is it hoffman composite race boats on facebook yep that's it yeah can go on that and uh no one chimed in for the 50 percent off on a race boat tonight oh, so oh well yeah hey snooze you lose man That's right. snooze you lose so thanks again for coming on next week we're going to be with bill gore don't forget august 7th through the 9th champions park lake we're going to be racing these tunnel boats uh hard That's and right. fast and we're going to have a hard right hander for everybody to have some fun then also stock outboard nationals july 12th through the 18th in Springfield, Ohio. Yep. Hopefully one day we're going to call this the power boat. What do I want to coin it? The, uh, the, the world capital of power boat racing, tunnel boat racing, whatever. We'll paint it on something. So who there. cares? So um, thanks again, Rick. Enjoy your evening. Thanks everybody for tuning in. And uh, hopefully we'll see everybody at the race course. Talk All to right, you later. Later.